The Voice Before the Void dot net. The Sorcery of Aflar by Dwayne W. Rimmel with H. P. Lovecraft. Read by The Voice Before the Void. The Council of Twelve, seated on the jeweled celestial dais, ordered that Aflar be cast from the gates of Belhaz Inn. He sat too much alone, they decreed, and brooded when toil should have been his lot. And in his obscure and hidden delvings, he read all too frequently those papyri of elder eons, which reposed in the Guathic shrine and were to be consulted only for rare and special purposes. The twilight city of Belhaz Inn had climbed backward in its knowledge. No longer did philosophers sit upon street corners speaking wise words to the populace, for stupid ignorance ruled within the crumbling and immemorially ancient walls. Where once the wisdom of the stars abounded, only feebleness and desolation now lay upon the place, spreading like a monstrous blight and sucking foul nurture from the stupid dwellers. And out of the waters of the all that meandered from the mountains of Azlaka to pass by the aged city, there rose often great clouds of pestilence that racked the people sorely, leaving them pale and near to dying. All this their loss of wisdom brought. And now the council had sent their last and greatest wise man from them. Aflar wandered to the mountains far above the city, and built a cavern for protection from the summer heat and winter chill. There he read his scrolls in silence, and told his mighty wisdom to the wind about the crags and to the swallows on the wing. All day he sat and watched below, or drew queer drawings on small bits of stone and chanted to them, for he knew that some day men would seek the cave and slay him. The cunning of the twelve did not mislead him. Had not the last exiled wise man's screams rent the night two moon rounds when people thought him safely gone? Had not his own eyes seen the priest's sword-slashed form floating by in the poison waters? He knew no lion had killed old Azik. Let the council say what they might. Does a lion slash with a sword and leave his prey uneaten? Through many seasons Aflar sat upon the mountain, gazing at the muddy all as it wound into the misty distance to the land where none ever ventured. He spoke his words of wisdom to the snails that worked in the ground by his feet. They seemed to understand, and waved their slimy feelers before they sank beneath the sand again. On moonlit nights he climbed the hill above his cave, and made strange offerings to the moon god Ale. And when the night birds heard the sound, they drew close and listened to the whispering. And when queer winged things flapped across the darkened sky and loomed up dimly against the moon, Aflar was content. Those which he had addressed had heeded his beckoning. His thoughts were always far away, and his prayers were offered to the pale fancies of dusk. Then one day, past noontide, Aflar rose from his earthen chair 
and strode down the rock mountainside. His eyes, heeding not the rotten stone-walled city, held steadfast to the river. When he drew near its muddy brink, he paused and looked up the bosom of the stream. A small object floated near the rushes, and this Aflar rescued with tender and curious care. Then, wrapping the thing in the folds of his robe, he climbed again to his cave in the hills. All day he sat and gazed upon the object, rummaging now and then in his musty chronicles and muttering awful syllables as he drew faint figures on a piece of parchment. That night the gibbous moon rose high, but Aflar did not climb above his dwelling. Queer night birds flew past the cavern's mouth, chirped eerily, and fled away into the shadows. Many days passed before the council sent their messengers of murder. But at last the time was thought ripe, and seven dark-browed men stole away to the hills. Yet when that grim seven ventured within the cave, they saw not the wise man Aflar. Instead, small blades of grass were sprouting in his natural chair of earth. All about lay papyri, dim and musty, with faint figures drawn upon them. The seven shuddered and left forthwith when they beheld these things. But as the last man tremblingly withdrew, he saw a round and unknown thing lying on the ground. He picked it up, and his fellows drew close in curiosity, but they saw upon it only alien symbols which they could not read, yet which made them shrink and quaver without knowing why. Then he who had found it cast it quickly over the steep precipice beside him, but no sound came from the slope below whereon it should have fallen. And the thrower trembled, fearing many things that are not known, but only whispered about. Then, when he told how the sphere he had held was without the weight a thing of stone should have, how it was like to have floated on air as the thistle-down floats, he and the six with him slunk as one from the spot and swore it was a place accursed. But after they had gone, a snail crawled slowly from a sandy crevice and slid intently over to where the blades of grass were growing. And when it reached the spot, Two slimy feelers stretched forth and bent oddly downward, as if eager to watch forever the winding river. <laughs>